Welcome to Fundera's webinar on SBA 7A loans. This is our last installment of our three-part series where we dive deep into the SBA 7A loan program. Today, we're going to be covering the end of the application process and some post-funding considerations. My name is Georgia, and I'm the Director of Content Marketing here at Fundera. I'm joined today by Abby and Tyler, who are Fundera's Senior SBA Specialists. Before I hand it off to them, I want to run through just a quick agenda. If you were not able to join us for part one or part two, we'll give you a quick recap of what we covered to catch you up to speed. Um, and then we'll give you a uh, drive right into the question and answer format at the end uh, where we'll cover any questions that you have about the SBA loan process. Uh, please just drop your questions in the question and answer format. And again, we're happy to cover any aspects of what we covered in this three part series. So don't hold back there. We'll leave 15 minutes at the end for that. All right, with that, I will pass it over to Abby and Tyler. Hey guys, it is great to be with you again. Um, so I'll quickly run over the part one recap. What we talked about in the first round was basically did an overview of SBA 7A loans. So these are small business loans that go up to $5 million and wanted to highlight that Fundera works specifically with lenders that offer a 10 year term up to $350,000. And that's because those are the loans that do not require any personal collateral. The 7A loan program, program is one of the most popular of all of the different types of SBA programs. And that is because it um, has some qualifications that we'll get into earlier that make it uh, make capital easily to access, easier to access for you small business owners. Then the last thing that we touched on on the part one was that this SBA 7A product is a permanent program. And so there's been a lot of some, there's been stimulus packages and the CARES Act, which included the EIDL loan and PPP loans. Those are great products and they are temporary due to what's going on with coronavirus. And so the 7A loan is going to continue long after coronavirus funding has closed. Then I just want to run through the qualifications that we talked about in the first, um, first part. So the basic qualifications to get a 7A loan are two years in business, having a personal FICO score of over 680. And that is, we look at the, we look at all three credit bureaus, but Experian is one that we um, primarily focus on there. You must be profitable year to date for this year. And then also looking at the last verified tax year. And that can be profitable after there have been add backs back to your um, bottom line. You also have to show that there, you meet some minimum ratios showing the amount of debt that you have on your books versus the income that comes in on a monthly basis. And then lastly, the, the important thing here is that we have to show that there is demonstrated need for this loan product, primarily related to growth or expansion of the business, refinancing higher interest debt, or something similar to that. So now Tyler will run through what we covered in part two. Thanks, Abby. So as you covered uh, in part one, in part two, we went over the entire application process at Fundera. Starting off with the initial document collection, you work with an account executive or a sales rep uh, to collect the bare minimum amount of documents needed for us to qualify you. This includes your tax returns, your profit and loss statement, debt schedule, uh, and a personal financial statement. From here, a credit analyst in-house at Fundera is able to determine your eligibility with our bank partners. This is very unique to Fundera because we do not have to submit your file to the bank in order to figure out whether or not you're qualified. It all remains in-house. Finally, you get sent to a relationship manager who will be the final uh, person in this process. They'll help you gather the rest of the documentation needed to complete this SBA loan. And then you'll go into underwriting and do a few more due diligence steps before finally getting funded. So just a quick review of the document collection for initial cash flow. It really depends on whether or not you filed your 2019 taxes. If you have filed your 2019 taxes, 
All you need to provide is an eligibility questionnaire, two years of business tax returns, two years of personal tax returns, a 2020 profit and loss statement, a business debt schedule, and six months of business bank statements. If you have not filed your business tax return, the list is gonna be very similar, but it's gonna add a few things. One, we will need a 2019 profit and loss statement. And then we're also gonna need proof of tax extension since business taxes were due earlier this year. Awesome. So we did the recap of the credit portion and the pre-qualification. Now, the remainder of the time, we want to talk through what happens once you've been pre-qualified and we start collecting all the documents for the application before we go to the bank. Um, these will be the last two steps of that process. So right now, what I want to run through is after you've been pre-approved, you just had you had provided all of those financial documents that Tyler just ran through. Um, that's what we needed to determine eligibility along with some of um, just some credit questions that you will have a conversation with um, up front. And so now once you're in packaging, you'll be working directly with a relationship manager. And this list, I wanted to run through these things. And on the next slide, we'll talk through some of the things that can kind of hold up the process and how we can get ahead of those. But what's required for every SBA loan starts with entity documents. And so these are going to be the original, a copy of the original articles of incorporation or articles of organization that have been filed with the Secretary of State. There are also some SBA specific documents. It's a member resolution to borrow, as well as a certificate of all of the members or owners of the company. These are two forms that are pretty easy to fill out, um, <clears throat> but just have to be on the specific bank, bank paperwork and so we'll provide those for you in a nice easy online way to do that. You also need to provide proof of insurance. This is something general liability is the baseline level of insurance that's required for all SBA loans. Um, in addition to that there will be workers compensation that's required if that's necessary in the state that you operate in. And then also occasionally there's another type called business personal property insurance and this covers any fixed assets that the business owns. The workers' compensation and the business personal property is not always required. It'll be dependent upon the structure of your business in the state requirements. Something else we'll need to provide are landlord documents, and this includes a commercial lease for all of the locations that you operate from or proof of ownership if you own the, the, built, the property outright. In addition to the commercial lease, there's two documents that are quite unique to the SBA application. It's a landlord subordination form and an option to renew. So these are two things that will work with your landlord to get, um, to get these signed and provide context, context as to why those are required. Another document that's needed is the SBA 7A application. This is also referred to as the 1919 form, 1919. And this, uh, this document is pretty easy to fill out. It's about four pages and it provides a, uh, answers where you initial some general questions about your background as a business owner, as well as the background of the business. Pretty straightforward there. You'll also provide, you've already provided the financial documents necessary to get the pre-approval, but in this packaging section, you'll also need to provide a balance sheet as well as some lenders are now asking for projections for the rest of the 2020, given um, they, they recognize that some of the interims or the year-to-date financials are not completely indicative of where the business is headed. Tax transcripts, these are a requirement because this basically verifies the tax returns that have already been provided to us. The tax transcripts come directly from the IRS and are a requirement in order to close. A resume, management resume, we often get questions on why this is required, but this is something that the underwriter looks at to basically understand you as the owner of the business, what your management experience has been. They'll include this as well as the business trend explanations in their underwriting memo that they'll submit for approval. And so this, these top documents help them create the story that goes along with the numbers that they see in the financials. So the most, more information you can provide here, the better, because think about it, they're, they're people that they wanna understand who you are, who the, how the business is operating, and in the nature of online lending, this is the way that they're able to do that. And then lastly, what we've already talked about is there's a specific form that we will 
fill out um, that breaks down the use of proceeds down to like the thousand dollars. And so this will help the underwriter also understand what you're planning to do with the funds. So I just wanted to note here that this is not an exhaustive list. This is um, pretty much mandatory for all documents or all applications that we work with. But each business that we work with here at Fundera, um, you'll be paired with a relationship manager and that list of documents will be tailored to your business and your needs and we won't ask for anything extra beyond what's the bare, like the absolute requirements in order to get you funded. So one, two, in the next slide, um, look at some of the documentation that we need that relies on third parties. And so sometimes these are things that we wanted to call out to you because it can, it can make the process go a little further or longer, but it also is what we are here for as relationship managers to help get ahead of these things, which when you are working with a bank directly or local bank, you may not always have this um, insight into what could cause things to slow down down the line. So UCC terminations, um, these are commonly can cause delays because you have to reach out. You have to one, determine who filed the UCC. And what this is, is a UCC lien is basically just shows that there's another business that has interest in your business. And so sometimes this is another debt that maybe wasn't included on your debt schedule or something that just needs to be um, taken care of before there's funding. So we can work with you on that. I already mentioned the landlord documents, but there are signatures that are required. And so each landlord is very different. Some have no problem signing this. Some have a lot more questions. And so we can work with you on getting these, um, getting these signed or providing the context needed. The 912 packet, this is required anytime there's a felony or a misdemeanor on any of the guarantor's records. And this is also, we'll, we'll ask you this up front, but there's a pretty extensive background search that the bank runs that we will check on and verify. This is not required for any traffic infractions. I just wanna be clear there. So if you have a speeding ticket or were pulled over without having your seatbelt on, that will not require this. But in some cases where there has been a misdemeanor or it's been 20 years ago where something happened, that's not an, it, it actually won't always it'll not impact the eligibility in some cases, but we just have to provide court documents. So we wanna get ahead of that. The insurance I mentioned, general liability is a requirement and insurance companies are very easy to work with. So we can work with you on and providing suggestions if you do not do not have that already, but it's something we also wanna get ahead of. Filings with the Secretary of State. So this is specific to if you, do business under a different name, or if you maybe have changed your location into a different state, but were originally organized in a different state. So I, I wanted to bring this up because some states, some Secretary of State offices, especially right now with COVID, um, can operate quite slowly. Uh, a lot of them have require you to mail in documents provide payment via check, that type of thing. And so this is something that you should just make note of. If you've been dragging your feet on getting in touch with the Secretary of State to file a DBA, if you're thinking about pursuing the SBA document or SBA loan, then uh, you should definitely get that taken care of. The last two payoff letters. Uh, this is something that other lenders don't like, always like to have their debts paid off early. And so sometimes they'll make it a little hard on you to do that, but um, just to assure you, it is okay to ask for that. And so we just want to be sure that we're aware th uh, that that is something that is required. And we typically ask for payoff letters twice in the process. We need it once during this application stage in order to verify the wiring information and the current balance. But then we will also need to request an updated payoff letter seven days before closing. And so that's so that we can have the most up-to-date balance and avoid any like overpayment or underpayment. Lastly here the, is IRS documentation. So this, I mentioned transcripts earlier. Transcripts can, can sometimes cause quite a, quite a delay. Um, we've determined, or we've seen sometimes where you think maybe that you filed your taxes from three years ago, but then the transcripts come back and they've been blank. Um, or your tax return got lost in the mail or something like that. For the SBA loan, there's really very little 
there's no leniency in that. We must show the last three tax years that have been verified. So it's something that we try to do as early in the process as we can to get ahead of those. But if you also know that there's, is, there's some challenges with the IRS, it would be good to get that taken care of sooner than later. This is the same with payment plans. If you owe anything outstanding to the, to the IRS, you cannot pay that off with the SBA loan. And you don't have to show that it's paid, been paid off completely, although that is one option. The other option is showing that you are on a payment plan and making installment agreement payments to the IRS to make that balance paid off. And the last thing here is the tax lien removal. So if there has maybe been taxes owed and you have had a tax lien placed on you personally or on the business, then that is something that must be um, reconciled before we can close and fund on an SBA loan. So um, once we provide all of these things and get it taken care of, again, this process, we can move as quickly as you would like to. And on average, we see SBA loans closing in about 30 days. But Tyler now is going to walk through what happens next once your application is complete and handed off to the bank. Great. So one thing to note about SBA underwriting is that two things are actually happening. There's bank underwriting, which is a focus on financials and reviewing of the credit qualifications of the borrower. This was previously vetted by the credit analyst earlier in the process. And so if all goes according to plan, this should go relatively smoothly. Banks will usually come back and ask questions regarding business financials and trends at this stage. But for the most part, this is a pretty straightforward stage where they just analyze the business's financials and credit scores. Then there's loan closing. This is a little bit more complicated and this makes sure that the application meets all of the SBA regulations. This is involving, this involves auditing all of the submitted documents, making sure that all the details are correct, making sure everything ties in correctly with what the SBA is looking for. Something unique to Fundera though, is that our partners complete these processes in parallel of each other. So while your file is going through bank underwriting, they, the bank's team also has closers working on your file. Most banks will work on underwriting first, get an approval, and then close the loan, which almost doubles the application time. And so by working with Fundera, you're essentially cut, cutting this processing time in half. Some other post-funding considerations that I often see uh, borrowers asking questions. For right now, the first six months of payments are paid by the government if you fund before September. So for example, if you fund on July 1st, you will not have a payment due until January 1st. The government is paying both the principal and interest of the first six months. And so it is a very good incentive to try and get your business some much needed capital during these times. If you need any additional financing post-funding, something to keep in mind is you must approach your bank to discuss this first. This is not only an SBA rule, but it's also in your contract with the bank that you will not get any additional debt or essentially stack debt on top of your SBA loan. The reason the banks do this is because they underwrite the file, your file, with a specific capital structure in mind, with specific debt in mind. And once you're funded, they want to make sure that your debt situation looks similar. But they also understand that people's situations change, especially over the life of a 10-year loan. And they want to discuss with you. They want to have this conversation. They want to help you. But you have to go back to them first. And then finally, all the banks that Funderas work with, works with will use an automatic ACH withdrawal monthly after funding. Right now, you've, the first six months are paid for, so that wouldn't happen until six months after funding. But in a normal world, once you fund, about one month later, the bank will start automatically withdrawing money on a monthly basis from the bank account that you got funded from. Uh, we get this question often because sometimes borrowers want to pay by check. They want to switch their accounts and banks all have post funding teams to take care of these requests. All right, thank you, Abby and Tyler, that was great. We have some questions coming in and we can use the remaining time to go through those. The first that I'll send to Abby is, 
can you get an SBA 7A loan if you've already gotten an EIDL loan? And is it harder to get a 7A loan right now in the coronavirus outbreak? Yeah, that's a great question. So the 7A loan, you can still get if you've received an EIDL loan, although it is going to be slightly harder. And it's going to be harder based on the, the qualification, like I mentioned, where you must show that there's a specific use and need. One thing with the EID alone is that that basically shows that you have been negatively impacted by coronavirus. One thing that the banks are very cautious of when issuing 7A loans is that they want to understand how you're going to use the SBA loan to grow your business and show that there has not been uh, too much of a negative impact due to COVID. So we do see it's not an automatic disqualifier, although it is something to consider and a few things to take into account too is, is how big of an EID loan you received and how much top line or net income you're still showing on your P&L. Those are things that the bank will look at. Great, thanks Abby. For Tyler, the next question is, as a sole proprietor, can this person still apply for a 7A loan? Absolutely, sole proprietors are absolutely eligible for this loan. Something I will say is that we've had people come into a little bit of trouble who are sole proprietors, but actually do not own a business. So you need to own a bit, some sort of business in order to apply for this loan. Even if that means that it's a single person in the business, you, and you're just a simple sole proprietor, you need to have some kind of business that you do uh, work under. So I know some people are will claim some sole proprietor income from some part-time work that they do. Uh, that one is a little bit more tricky than, for example, a freelance writer that has an established business with the state and does freelance writing on top of their normal job. That would be eligible. Thanks, Tyler. Next for Abby is, this is a great question. If this borrower or business owner showed a loss in 2018, are they automatically disqualified, even if they show profit in 2019 and profit year to date? Yeah, so I will actually defer this to Tyler, but I will say that each bank has their specific qualifications on the, the type of credit box that they're comfortable with at this time. Um, it will, one of the things that'll factor in is if you have filed both of your tax returns, personal and business for 2019, that will, that'll be beneficial if that shows your profit there. Um, but Tyler, do you have anything specific you want to add? Not really. You've really hit the nail on the head. Banks use what's called last verified year in order to underwrite. And so what this means is that they take the last verified tax year as the base year in order to look at an approval. And so, as you said, if you, have, if you have not filed your 2019 taxes and you filed for an extension, then you would not be approved because your last verified year would be 2018 with the loss. However, if you have filed your 2019 business and personal taxes, the bank would use 2019 as the last verified year. And if 2020 also shows a profit on the profit and loss statement, then you would be eligible. Great, thanks both. I'll kick this question back to Abby. Will most banks accept a prepayment of a 7A loan without a prepayment penalty or will they mostly uh, charge a prepayment penalty if you choose to pay early? Yeah, so that's a good question. And it's one of the benefits of this 7A loan. There are no prepayment penalties associated with this. Um, there is one caveat where if you do wanna make more, make a payment of 20% or more of the remaining principal balance, then you'll just want to, the bank just requires that you submit written notice to do that. But there will not be additional fees incurred with paying that off. Great, thanks Abby. For Tyler, uh, this person is wondering what the next steps are to apply or start the application for a 7A loan if they've already gotten a PPP loan through Fundera. That's a great question. So the first thing I would do is I would reach out to the Fundera representative that helped you with the PPP loan. Alternatively, you can apply on fundera.com for a 7A loan and someone will connect with you. 
uh, and you could just explain the situation to them. But my first step would be to contact whoever you worked with on the PPP loan. Great, thanks Tyler. We'll squeeze one more question in because we know we started late. Uh, for Abby, while we're talking about PPP loans, uh, this part person is wondering uh, if there's a difference between PPP loans and 7A loans, and if you could walk through that difference for us, that would be great. Definitely. The 7A loan and the PPP loan are two separate products. There might be some confusion because the PPP loan from the, like the government's point of view, it actually falls into a 7A category. But we talked about this in the first session. Um, there are different types of 7A loans and the ones that we work on are SBA 7A small loans. And so they are two separate products. Like I said, the 7A loan, small loan is here to stay. Whereas the PPP loan is actually that program, which is specifically for payroll and payroll protection, which is a forgivable loan, that's actually going to expire at the end of this month. And so that's that temporary program. And then once that expires, the 7A small loan program will still remain in place and we'll be able to work with businesses to obtain that. We can, we can work with businesses who have also received a PPP loan as well as are looking to pursue a 7A loan. Um, that is, since they're really for different use cases here. Um, but yeah, that is the details, the differences between the 7A and the PPP. Great, thanks so much, Abby. Okay, that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you to all of you for your questions and for attending. And thanks to Abby and Tyler for walking through the slides and giving those answers. Just a quick reminder, while this is our last webinar of this series, we will be hosting more webinars and live Q and A's on SBA 7A loans, other lending options, more considerations for your business in the future. So stay tuned for more from Fundera on new webinars coming up. We will be following up with a form as well that we'd love for you to all to fill out so we can learn more about what you're looking for from, from Fundera. Any topics you'd love to cover, uh, topics you'd love to dive deeper into, we'd love to know that. So stay tuned uh, for that in your inbox. And thanks again, everyone, and see you in a following webinar very soon.